Okay, computer technology. It's a little bit difficult this week because I'm teaching three different subjects, basically, all the economics. Um, meaning I'm getting easily distracted and confused. One thing in advance. There is this book, Remy geniusly found it somewhere. It's great fun. It's economics in, as a cartoon. Economics mix as mixing. Um, I said finally, okay, put it into the library. There are, I think, two copies. Um, I have a little bit difficulties with it because it's, it's really fun to read it, but you have to know, actually, you should study economics before, and then you read it. Um, if you read it now, which you, of course, will do, probably more than, read it more than in the textbook, um, be careful in terms of what you take out of it and where you really have to study then the serious part. The serious part means in economics, I don't know if I quoted this here, uh, I heard recently by Yanis Varoufakis, the uh, Greek colleague, saying uh, economics is the uh, discipline or the, the religion of equation or something like this. Um, that we always pretend that we have an exact science, and I would not uh, um, contest that economics is a science, an academic discipline, but at the same time, as we saw already a couple of times, and as we will see, there is not always or never ever uh, one answer. The one answer is there if it is about a definition, the one answer is there if it is about a calculation. But at the same time, we always have to know what are we actually calculating and why do we do it. It is at this stage more or less simple because we are working on a kind of low level with only few variables. If you have then later, and occasionally I make you aware of it, if we have later these complex equations not dealing with one product, but with several products. Not dealing with several products of, of one department or one sector, but cross-sector. Uh, if we don't deal with one country or two countries, but with several countries. Um, this makes things enormously complex. Uh, Janis said at the same stage something like, uh, if you write a PhD, you just have to get a new uh, equation. Nobody asks what you are doing, but the important thing of writing your PhD thesis then is getting a new, new equation out, making it looking fine, making the solution look uh, and, and being correct. It is not asked, it is not important what actually is behind it. So try, and in this way actually this economics book is pretty good, try to take it as as issue of, of real social processes. And real processes you don't see, and this is what we actually intend to do, to hide these real processes. Aggregate demand, a matter of aggregation, which means we are not looking, and this is, is especially true for macroeconomics, but as well for microeconomics, we are not talking about the individual product. We are not looking at individual prices of products, but we are looking at what is going on in society as a matter of this economic unity, entity. Now, I say it in this way for one special reason, that, of course, one enterprise is as well a larger unit 
a larger entity that consists of different individual parts. So you have different departments there. You have accounting, you have finance, you have production, you have uh, trading raw material, all this. In one way or another, there is at least a parallel between the micro-level and the macro-level in this respect as well. Then we look as well at the GDP as a matter of aggregation, meaning we are not interested in individual activities, be it in individual activities of individual enterprises, or be it the individual activities of uh, sectors, that we are looking at the overall picture in the society. Usually if we talk about the demand side, we talked about uh, aggregation in uh, other respect, namely supply. They, of course, they go together at, at the end, uh, put together, demand and supply. This is the idea of economics. But the usual thing that happens with the aggregate demand is the downward slope. Meaning the relation between prices and economic activities takes the form of a downward slope. If we have more money, we buy more things, meaning the aggregate activity is higher. If we have less money, we buy less things, and with this, consequently, subsequently, the activity is lower. It is not about what you do as individual. It is about what happens in society. Methodologically, however, it is, of course, what you do as individual, as individual because we talked about this individual, the methodological individualism. Our thinking of economics is actually a process of aggregation. We always think whatever happens in the economy of a country is the aggregation what individuals do. You do not coordinate, you do not plan, it is your decision as individual to buy, not to buy, to behave on the market in one or another way. You do not coordinate with others, but at the same time, there is of course a channel, or there are different channels, where you look what is somebody else doing, what is a product that has a high reputation, status goods, and then you say, okay, then I want to have this as well. Foreign holidays, a typical example. I don't want to make foreign holidays. I don't want to have this stress, especially then European holidays or American holidays. It's a long trip to go wherever you want to go or you don't want to go, actually, because it's too much effort. But everybody does it. It's a sign of wealth. It's a sign of education. It's a sign that you can afford it. So you do it. So still, you do it as individual. So we have this general pattern of development of a downward slope. To what is it linked? And we talked about it in the first semester. Elasticity. Meaning we have products with a certain character. And this character of the products, of the goods, and I'm now talking especially of the goods, 
not of the commodities, not in terms of exchange, but in terms of their use value, this character decides or influences our decision. What do we do? Buy, do we buy or won't we buy? Is it something where we have choices or where we don't have choices? So price elasticity was defined in this way as a responsiveness of quantity demanded, meaning bought, as a good to its own price. There is a price, and then it is the question, do we buy it or won't we buy it? Elasticity, we went through the calculation of it, you can go back to the first semester, or you can get it here from this slide again. And we said that there are at least these five conditions that influence the elasticity. If and when close substitutes are available. Meaning basically if we have a choice, if we have an actual choice. There are certain products we can easily, that we can easily substitute with others. This links to the second one, for narrowly defined goods than broadly defined goods. If we have broadly defined goods, food, we need something, we have to get something to eat. We cannot substitute this. We cannot say, okay, I don't eat for the next two weeks. Instead of this, I make biking tours. I cycle or I go to the theater. But we have the decision, substitutes, to say, I don't want to eat fish or rice. This, the euro substitution would be there, rice, noodles, pasta. It doesn't matter what we eat in this respect. So there we can substitute. Luxurious and necessities. Of course, there are some goods we need. The necessities, as I said, food. We may need some means of transport. If we live in a very remote area, if we have to go regularly to one place, for instance, to work, then transport, means of transport, is a necessity. But what does it mean in concrete terms? When I lived in Ireland, I was cycling kind of like mad, uh, 25 kilometer, twice per day. And people said, wow, this is really great. And then they told me, actually, my father, 20 odd, 30 years ago, they went every day 50 kilometers twice. So this puts things into, uh, into relations, into a context. Everybody was saying, actually, he's a little bit mad, he should get a car and make it easy for himself. So a car would not be considered as a luxurious good under these conditions. It is relative what you need, and of course, it is a personal preference as well. Then in the long run, in the short run, is the other thing. Do we need things? And if we need them, do we need them now? This is what you do. Education. In a way, it is exactly this delay of the satisfaction of needs and wants. You want to get an income. You could get the income now. All of you are in a working age. All of you could have a job somewhere and earn money. 
but you delay the decision and say, I don't want, I'd want to have another job that requires this education. So I delay my income now for a later stage because then I get a higher income, I prefer the work or for whatever reason. So it's not only the quantity, quantities, but of course in economics it's the easiest to deal with. What I just thought about income, you delay income from today to get later a different income, is the same with spending. You delay the spending today, you save money, and then you say, actually, I delay it in order to be able to buy something tomorrow. Then you see exactly where things are actually going, getting a little bit complex. You delay possibly consumption today because you want to buy a more luxurious good tomorrow. You are able to buy today a cheap car, but you want to have the more luxurious, more expensive car, and then you say, okay, I can do another year, another two years without this luxurious, more luxurious good, and I will save the money and later I will buy it. This is the background influencing the aggregate demand, elasticity of goods, and I should add the elasticity of services. Because usually in economics we are dealing with, with, with goods and services. And we should be then even more precise and say it is about commodities. As I said, frequently, and will repeat myself there frequently, it is about exchange values and not about use values. This means it is about commodities and not about goods. The good is something you have, it's the concrete thing, it is not made per exchange, you can do it in your garden, you can plant your carrots, but as commodities, they go to the market and they are exchanged there. Now there are the three main factors that influence the aggregate demand. You see, in terms of thinking, in terms of methodology, it is actually quite difficult. You have individual behavior, methodological individualism. What you do is your decision, and this is the decisive thing for the overall process. We only put it together in some abstract calculations. Now the second one is we have some assumptions, elasticity, of what you will do. If you have a huge amount of money, luxurious goods or the price of luxurious goods, the character of luxurious goods is of course higher. If you have an extremely high monthly income, the change of a price of a good of commodity of 10,000 yuan doesn't matter. You can buy a uh, uh, a very expensive handbag. It doesn't matter. It's a small amount of your budget. If we take our income, assuming that you have a, an ordinary income, it's a huge amount of money. This is definitely a luxurious thing. If something costs 50,000 yuan, if something costs 100,000, if you have enough money, what is it? It doesn't matter. You spend it. 
But even there, the principal law is valid as well, that at some stage you will, to take more the ridiculous side of it, you will have to consider, do you buy another aircraft or do you buy another villa for two million? So what is relevant for the extreme is relevant for the normal, and it's not only the extreme on the very high, on the, uh, on the, on the side of the top earners, but it is as well the relevance on the low earners. For somebody who has very, very little money, it may be a luxurious, a decision on a luxurious thing to say, I will go to the cinema. I will go out for a meal instead of eating here in the canteen. This, these are decisions. Now we have, this is the general behavior orientation in economics. And then we have this of the overall situation in the economy, if you want. Interest rate, wealth effect, and net export effect. What is this about? Interest rates, and this is what we will do the next and the session afterwards. Interest rate is a matter of money, it is a matter of the monetary system, and it is a political decision. Because the interest rate is defined by two mechanisms. On the one hand, it's as well a matter of the market. Money is a commodity, and as such it can be traded. But it is as well, especially when it comes to the, um, to the interest rate, a matter of political decisions. In very simple terms, but really in very simple terms, it's on the level of the economics, the book, you can say the government can produce money as they want. And with this they produce, the, they, they define the interest rate. It's not as simple as that, but in the extreme case, they can just print money. So there is more money available. Or they can say, well, sorry, stop it. We withdraw money from the market. It's not available anymore. And in this way, they can uh, increase the, or decrease the interest rate. And of course, money gets more expensive when prices increase, meaning if there is a huge demand for money, then the interest rate will increase. The political decision is then, and we come later back to this, is then to say, we have to stop this. We have to make money available that people buy it. Because we want to foster the economic growth. We want to foster economic activities. So we give money for a low interest rate that, so that people will take it and invest. Second point, the wealth effect. If the real household wealth increases, meaning if you are more wealthy, if you have more resources, monetary resources available, then the aggregate demand will increase. Meaning, if you have money, you can spend it. As simple as that. If you don't have it, the other way around, you will decrease the purchase. There is again something important going hand in hand with it. Namely, a very subjective factor, trust, confidence. If I have a job, and if I can be sure that I will have this job for the rest of my life, and if I can be sure that this job gives me social security, whatever it is, in case of being sick, in, tame, in case of getting old, I still would have enough money 
from old age pension, from social benefits, from unemployment benefits, whatsoever. Then I can say, okay, I spend it. If the situation is different and I don't know what happens next year, let alone that I know what happens in five years or ten years, then I will go to the side of savings and say, at least I have some money here that helps me to cope with the situation of being unemployed, of being sick, or of old age. Now the risks are very varied and it's not, be careful with the terms, it's not really a risk to be old. We all want to be old. And we want to be so old that we don't have to work anymore. That we don't want to, that we don't have to work anymore. We simply don't want, at least not for the income. We may want to work just for fun, it's, but it's not about not being able to work because of old age, retirement. So it's not really a risk. The term risk is a little bit problematic here. It would be as well the risk of having a child. It's not really a risk. But at the same time, economically speaking, a child is a cost factor. There is always something you have to pay. A, you have to bring up this child, feed it, and then you have to bring it to the educational process at some stage, which as well costs some money. If there are fees involved or not, it always costs some money. So it is as well something where you may consider, okay, the public system is not sufficient, or I cannot rely on it, so this means I will save some money. We will see later that this is, of course, itself a risk. The term inflation, you know it. You can bring your, bank, your money to the bank. After 10 years, you have 1 million saved. But these 1 million, the value of it, what you can buy for it, is more or less nothing in the extreme case. The same, and there we have another dimension of risk, if you invest money, go to the stock market and say, I have the money, I don't need it now, I'll save it, but I won't put it under, under my pillowcase, I won't put it into the bank, as a, into a saving account, but I invest it. You never know what happens with the investment, will it be successful or not. So in this way it is as well a matter of perceptions. How do you feel about it? Are you ready to take a risk? Or do you want to be on the safe side? And on the safe side means there are political de developments uh, on the national level, on the individual level, and on the global level. The global level. High prices, low exports or less exports, meaning the net export rate depends, of course, on the demand coming from other countries, but not only. Demand is relative. And there you have again the reference to elasticity. Let's take raw material. In some cases, of course, there is no other choice. You need the raw material, you have to buy things. 
if you need oil and every economy, every production process, every consumption needs oil in one or another form, you have to get it. The one thing is you have it. Just dig a little hole, get the oil out, into the bucket, to the process of production. Fine. No problem. Now you have it, but it's very deep in the ground, and it would be more expensive to get it out there than it would be just imported. Import export, it's always what is export for the one is import for the other. So now you buy the cheap oil, low prices, from another country. Now for whatever reason, this happened in 73, I think, 72, 73, the oil exporting countries said, hang on, price goes up. You won't get our oil as cheap as you got it before. I don't know the price development of one barrel of oil. It was tremendous. There was a huge difference from one day to another. And this was, of course, a problem. The high price had to be paid by many countries because they didn't have a choice. And some other countries actually looked for other sources. They dig the hole deeper in their own ground because this was more effective than getting it as import. So this is why I said in the beginning it's getting a little bit com more complicated at some stage when you have to consider time as well. There is another dimension actually we have now, nowadays, it's called peak oil and peak everything that we have to consider that we run out of oil. As simple as that. You can dig as deep as you want your hole into the ground. There won't be any oil. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical about it. Uh, there are as well different methods of so-called fracking that you really can reach areas which are of, of which we are not aware at this stage. But at least it's getting more and more expensive. So then you shift to different sources. This is one reason. Oil is too expensive, get the sun. Sun energy, wind energy, water energy. Another reason is, of course, the environmental cost. Meaning fossil uh, raw materials, uh, this is very expensive not only to buy it but as well to clean it up. The sun shines anywhere. It just is collected and transformed into energy. So back to the playground. As I said, we try to deal with simple models in economics. So we have slides, slopes, going up, climbing up, going, going down, climbing up. And we always have or think about this process as process of balancing. There is this equilibrium, and ideally, of course, this thing is in a standing position, is in a stable position, but we know this doesn't happen. So we say demand supply, they always change a little bit, not only on the individual level, but as well on the uh, level of aggregation. But at the same time, the aggregate demand and the aggregate supply will come to this balanced level. If we don't have enough money to buy the oil, what can we do? We stop using it, if we can, or we replace it, we substitute. 
if we can. If we can't do both or one of these, we are in serious trouble. Of course, this can happen as well, but usually we hope at least that it won't. So, aggregate demand, what happens there as variables leading to change? Was well, seven, and of course you can add something, and of course you have to think what is the weight, what is the meaning of these individuals. Overall income, this is why it is important that we talk about aggregation, and it is important to, to see the difficulty. The overall income of this economy is increasing. So we have an increase of demand. But, there is always a but. What happens if we have an extreme inequality? These millionaires who have money that can throw it away, a small group, and then we have a large group of people who cannot buy anything. If you calculate it, it's the overall income with a high figure. But in distributional terms, it looks different. There is a majority, possibly a majority in the society that cannot buy what they need. We are in trouble. Meaning we don't come to this balanced system. We don't come to an ideal point where aggregate demand and aggregate supply are overlapping. They do it somewhere. But we are not producing, we will come back to this again, we are not producing what people need, but we are pre producing what we can sell. So if the situation is so, we will produce luxurious aircrafts and luxurious handbags and luxurious I don't know what, but we will not produce what people need, what the majority of people need. The number of jobs is, of course, linked. This is the second part, then, is linked to the income. Meaning, if people have jobs, and if people have decent jobs, they will be able to have to increase the income. This, then, is not the extreme luxurious income, but now we are talking about the average income that we have actually a large, what is called, middle class. A large the majority of the population is in a situation they have a job, they have income, and they can buy whatever they need. And of course, ideally, they can buy more. This is the overall wealth of households, meaning, of course, the core of the income is having a job, is labor, labor power, selling the labor power. But at the same time, there is more to it. As I said, and it is very different from country to country, from family to family, you may have social benefits, child benefits. You may have a second apartment which you let and somebody else pays the rent and you get money out of this. You may have saving, you get something out of the saving. All this contributes to the overall household income household wealth, but it is as well if you have actually your little patch there, your little vegetable garden, and you have your own vegetables. This does not contribute to your income, because you don't sell this, but it contributes to your wealth, because you do not have to buy this. I mentioned before the confidence issue. If we go ahead, if we think, if we perceive the situation in this way, that things will go, move on in this way, a good, stable development, 
we will develop in another way, we, we will decide in another way, and we will say, okay, under these conditions, I can move on and I can increase my demand. This is a matter of individuals, this is a matter of um, private households, but as well on the aggregate level. And it is a level of enterprises, meaning the desire to invest. The desire of, to invest is on the one hand this matter of confidence, but it is as well the desire, I get something for it. I can, with this and that investment, I can get a return. Otherwise, I'm not doing it. I will not be economically active and have an enterprise or whatsoever to say at the end of the day, great fun, I love the, love the work, I invested 100 yuan and I have 100 yuan. We only do it because we want to have at least 100.01. And of course we want to, want to have more, meaning if we, have, if we have the expectation that we get more, we will, our desire to invest is increasing. Government taxation and spending is of course a matter Taxation is very complicated in details. I don't know if you ever will uh, have this as, as, as part of the overall course. But what is interesting for us here and now are at least the three different uh, ways. The taxation on income of workers. If you work, if you have a job, you have to pay taxes, as simple as that. And of course it matters how much taxes you have to pay. If you have an enterprise, you have to pay taxes. Again, the same story, it matters how much you have to pay. And this is a means of policy making to influence demand and to influence supply in investment. If I have a business, and I know I have to pay a huge amount of taxes, the expectation of return is automatically going down. It's a simple calculation. If I get a return of 100%, but I have to pay 50% taxes, there is a return, effectively, real return of 50. Because the 50, I work for something else. Now the 50 can go into something that I can consume, meaning that is useful for my enterprise. Streets, education, that contributes then for having, for maintaining my life. And the, the last point briefly is foreign incomes. Of course, if there is money outside of the country, foreign incomes, there is this readiness as well to increase the purchases. And to uh, increase with this the aggregate demand. So far, thank you.